Okay, so why, why, why don't we get going? Um, okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center. Um, I, I wanna make a quick note that this lecture is being recorded and will be published online. Um, the, uh, the, I, the ISC aims to foster uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technologies. And the lecture series uh, is focused, uh, is, is presenting leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technologies and its place in the world. Um, a bit about our speaker today, uh, Roger Crooks is an assistant professor in the Department of Informatics at UC Irvine. Uh, his research examines how the use of digital technology by public institutions contributes to the uh, minoritization of working class communities of color. Uh, his current project explores how community uh, organizers in working class communities of color use data for activist projects. Um, uh, Roderick has, has published extensively in human computer interaction and science and technology studies and social science venues, um, including, you know, addressing topics as, uh, such as political theory and online participation, equity of access and, and document theory. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to introduce, uh, you'd like to give a warm welcome to Roderick. Uh, so here you go. Welcome. Okay, uh, excellent. Thank you, Dr. O'Hara. Uh, can everybody see and hear me? I guess so. Okay, so this is the talk I'm working on. I think I just got a comment that people can't see in here. Yes, thank you for the response. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about agonism and activism today. Most of this talk is gonna be about community organizing and community responses to uh, data. But before we do that, I wanted to plug some of the work of my students. Uh, I run, I now run a group called the Evoke Lab and Studio. Um, and this is some of the stuff that I've been working on with my students. Uh, mostly publications for ACM venues like Kai. We have some stuff coming out for ACM, uh, fair, accurate, transparent algorithms of so the FACT conference. Um, and we're also working on some stuff for CSCW. This is just the most recent stuff that we have. Um, and uh, these are my doctoral students that I'm authoring this with. So uh, with my students, I'm always in thinking about and interested in issues of access to technology. Uh, critical research that is thinking about uh, access to technology and also trying to locate access to technology within broader questions of political economy. So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today in the context of a book that I'm working on. But in general, that's what my whole research group is working on. So we'll turn those ideas around a little bit today. Uh, but I definitely want to uh, promote the work of my students here as well. So when we think about access to technology, I've chosen this definition, one that's pretty close to my heart, that's produced by the American Library Association. Uh, and so the American Library Association says equity of access is one of its bedrock values, that it's one of its most central and most important virtues. And here they say quite plainly that equ equity of access means that all people have the information they need, regardless of age, education, ethnicity, language, income, physical limitations, or geographic barriers. It means they are able to obtain information in a variety of formats, electronic as well as print. It also means they are free to exercise their right to know without fear of censorship or reprisal. And this statement goes on to say, while internet use is now commonplace, we have not yet bridged the digital divide. The latest statistics show us that African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, and older adults are least likely to use the internet as are people with incomes over under $25,000 per year and those who live in rural areas. The barrier is not only access to computers, many people lack the basic literacy and computer skills needed, needed to navigate the web. And so the thing that interests me about this, uh, this virtue of access um, is certainly its goal. It's, it's very laudable and it's very uh, esteemable goal, but it's also the way that this description of equity of access immediately slides into a description of racialized and minoritized communities. And the way that this description really rides on a deficit and an understanding of a particular deficit in this community. So this 
interest in access is what originally brought me to research. And I would say, although my approach to access is fairly critical, this really is the sort of central problematic that I'm interested in. And at the other pole, I think of this desire to produce equity via information technologies, via computing. This other end is kind of the other extreme, or I would say the, the sort of opposite polarity of access. This is um, something that I just found in the news, but this is uh, a group called Dignity in Schools. This is a group of community organizers, some of them really close to the community where they live in Minneapolis, some of them from national advocacy organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union. And this woman, Marika Pfefferkorn, she coined the phrase cradle to prison algorithm. And so she incorporated in her ongoing um, advocacy for children and advocacy for schooling, a real strong criticism of technology, particularly as it's deployed in working class communities of color. So um, the cradle to prison algorithm is not a phrase that I use or I'm gonna engage with today. It's, a, it's the intellectual creation of this particular community organizer. But I got interested in the relationship between these kind of positive and beneficial valences of technology that we see in articulations of equity of access. And then this other polarity, this kind of response to computers and technology in minoritized communities, a political response in the form of community organizers who wanna refuse technologies of aggregation analysis and visualization of data. So the project I'm gonna to talk to you today about is exactly that. It, it, it's trying to bridge together as an object of study on one hand, uh, these articulations of virtue in technological access and on the other end, these, these responses, all in the very same working class communities of color. Um, and I look in particular at schools, at public schools, K through 12 schools, as sites where we could go to look for these tensions and what we expect of computing technology, how, they are, how it's received in the communities where it goes and this sort of interplay back and forth between articulations of access and kind of political organized responses. Uh, so especially in educational settings and especially in minoritized communities, access to technology is supposed to be beneficial. So here in California, as in other states uh, and in other places in the United States, public schools are extremely racially segregated and have been so for many decades. Public schools in California are as racially segregated as they have been at any time since the Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s. And so I, I don't find that at all coincidental to these articulations of uh, the value of access to digital technology. I treat access to digital technology as a virtue, and I'm interested in the way that it's animated a bunch of financial investments, policy proposals, even pedagogical decisions in the classroom level for over two decades. And in my mind, access really represents a sort of unquestioned consensus of public policy, common sense, philanthropy, and research. So I'm interested in how this access to valorized forms of digital technology in the form of education technology promises benefits at a variety of scales. So early experience with technology is supposed to nudge Black and Latinx youth from the working class towards uh, higher education, probably in a STEM field, and maybe position them for high paying jobs in the tech sector. Urban schools themselves are gonna benefit from engagements with technology. They're gonna be remade and rescued from uh, decades of putative failure and dysfunction. And then working class communities themselves are gonna benefit from access to technology in the form of public and philanthropic investment, but also through a kind of class mobility via the educational opportunities that accompany these ed tech investments. These rewards are promised not just by uh, self-interested technologists or you know, self-avowed evangelists. These benefits are pursued by students, teachers, parents, and administrators in working class communities themselves. So there is even there a kind of consensus over what the, the sort of benefits of this virtue of access could be. So what I'm asking is why, despite this high-minded, popular, and plausible formation, has access to technology yet to deliver any such benefits to its presumed beneficiaries? To answer this question, I have a larger book project called Access is Capture. And in this project, I locate both the virtue of access to technology and all the practices that unfold in pursuit of it at the intersection of datafication and racial capitalism. From the perspective of these sociological frames, access to technology appears not as a distribution of needed goods, but as the configuration of a resource field. And I'll tell you some more about what I mean by that. I want to first just kind of go through some of these terms that I've been using that I'm going to use in the rest of this talk. First, minoritized. 
Munoz here writing that it is a term to index citizen subjects who due to antagonisms within the social, such as race, class, and sex, are debased within the majoritarian public sphere. So as opposed to a term like underrepresented or minority or underserved, minoritized draws attention to multiple forms of identity or multiple forms of belonging and dif indifference and to pervasive social asymmetries. So to me, this term makes clear that when we talk about life in working class communities of color that experience greater degrees of racist aggression, economic precarity, housing displacement, or environmental stress, we're not talking about logical direct consequences of demography. We are talking about relations of power and authority, uh, often filtered through some organ of the state. The term minoritized reminds us that the public sphere itself is defined, constituted, and managed according to the specific interests of the dominant cultural group, and that it is the interests of this dominant cultural group that produce and reproduce our political orders. Next, I'm also going to talk about urban schools. Urban schools is a term of art that I borrow from education. It's a kind of coy euphemism uh, as a way to discuss those high poverty public schools that serve minoritized communities, primarily Black and Latinx, primarily in central cities previously hollowed out by white flight, and now the sense of intense housing displacement. So I have a lot of problems with this term, uh, but in terms of uh, research, it positions me very quickly with respect to public services delivered in working class communities of color, especially education. And so we should note here that urban schools in Southern California, just like urban schools all over the United States, are sites of intense racial segregation, uh, sites of intense uh, uh, inequity in funding, and also sites of a vigorous kind of ongoing school reform movement that seeks to uh, transform the terms by which the state offers education in those communities. So most of my field work has been set in these communities and the schools that serve them. I also use this term datification. Datification uh, is a, I treat this as both a sociological and a kind of historical term, but it is, it speaks to the way that data in all its various forms and guises has achieved new significance, new modes of circulation, and new ways of shaping collective life. Datification names the increasing mediation of many forms of sociality by data intensive network technologies and platforms. It also names the imperative for organizations, including organizations that serve the public, to become data driven. And it also names a set of beliefs about what data are, what they can do, and how they stand in relation to things in the world. And so this is why I say datification is both infrastructural, cultural, and ideological. And it's ideological in the sense that datification presents data as a generic medium that can capture the qualities of anything in the world by measuring them and then recording these measurements. From this perspective, data is merely a vehicle that turns any domain of social life or collective living into something a computer can understand, a neutral means of representing things that are already out in the world. So this proposition offers an appealing metaphysical egalitarianism in that to a computer, everything is just data. But this conception, however tempting or however useful it might be, uh, rests on a tight coupling of data and things in the world, which in other research I dispute. Um, it also argues that this relationship is bi-directional, such that working on data means working on things in the world and vice versa, obviously. Projecting into the future, mapping territories, making sense of disparate experience, the potentials of operating on a datafied world are endless and tantalizing. But thinking of the whole world in terms of something that is uh, computable carries political risks, which I'm going to talk about towards the end of this talk. Uh, so last term that we need to sort of put all this together is racial capitalism. Racial capitalism is a critique that draws attention to the ways that the history of capitalism is also a history of the production and management of racialized subjects. So despite our, the, the, maybe the claims of our dominant techno-scientific elite that the production of scientific knowledge and its incorporation in tools and platforms amounts to a kind of civilizational progress, uh, Robinson's work in, in Black Marxism and his concept of racial capitalism reminds us that contemporary capitalism has in no way distinguished itself from earlier forms of uh, collective organization in terms of the presence of war, material want, or social conflict to its beneficiary classes, capitalism is now, as it ever was, an opportunistic strategy, uh, infinitely adaptable to conditions and possibilities. From Robinson's work, 
uh, we would argue that capitalism does not answer answers to slavery, violence, imperialism, or genocide. It treats them as profit centers. So putting all these together, my main argument in this book is that uh, access to technology indexes the configuration of a resource field, one that is marked by extractions from minoritized communities and the state to the tech sector. So there may be material goods or computers or access to data that are granted, but the benefits and the capital that accumulates from those almost only accumulate to individuals, not to collectivities. The collectivity that benefits from this resource field in this configuration are in fact the, the, the platforms and the tech sector itself. So central to my argument then is this idea of extraction. So that's all set up in this first uh, section of the book. I'll run quickly through these uh, next couple sections, but I wanna focus primarily on what I have labeled here as section four. But to make this argument and to support my idea about the extractive nature of education technology and the extractive nature of access more generally, uh, I run through a kind of historical progression of access and the kind of material forms of, of computing that promise different sorts of benefits. Um, I rely in this section a lot on the work of the historian Joy Rankin and on the anthropologist Morgan Ames. And I just have in my photos here some sort of greatest hits of ed tech. On the left, you see the Plato system. This is a kind of pre-internet network technology um, that was used a lot in uh, university education. On the upper right, I have the Logo system, which was popular in the 1980s as the kind of personal computer market developed. And then down on the right, I have a still from the One Laptop Per Child program, a kind of more recent education technology access program. And so in this section of the book, what I'm arguing is that although the material substrate of computing changes, these ideas about progress and these ideas about access do not. And so they remain stable over time. And then I also wanna point in this section to uh, the kind of current configuration of access, the way that it prioritizes multiple devices, so this kind of proliferation of tablets, phones, and laptops used in education, commercial platforms that then consolidate data from all these different sources, and then finally, uh, tools of aggregating, analyzing, and visualizing data that are, that are used uh, to manage all this data that is produced by all these devices. Uh, so to transform these sort of banal and mundane activities of everyday schooling into this saleable, fungible resource of data. Uh, so uh, to do that, I then turned to some field work that I did. Uh, this first project that I did was from 2013 to 2016, and I went to a high school where they had done a sort of hardware-based access project. These are some kind of data about the school, but it was one high school in South Los Angeles, uh, I followed around the teachers in the school, the four principals in the school, the four guidance counselors and the 27 teachers. I attended classes. I attended school events like prom and graduation. I met with students in their homes. I met their parents. I went to church with them. But in general, I just followed around students to find out what happens in a school when you suddenly give everybody in the school a new computing device, in this case, um, an iPad. Uh, and so this school, again, is an urban school. So that means that it's, you know, roughly six or 700 students, that 95% of these students are Latinx, 4% are African American, and that uh, during the, the whole three years with which I had a relationship with the school, no student identified as white or Asian. 98% of students at the school qualify for free lunch. So my finding in this part of the project, I'll just uh, share with you a sort of access-based uh, quote that has to do with uh, the founding of the program. So here uh, in its inception, someone speaking of the project says, all of our students, not some but all, should have the same access to learning tools they need to achieve in the 21st century. Ultimately, we wanna close the digital divide and level the playing field, not only with educational access, but technological access. So what I found in this uh, aspect of the project was that the use of tablet computers followed a very predictable trend first observed by Larry Cuban, high access, low use. So although students had access to a device physically, they, did not, they were not used in any sort of transformative way in routine education. High school education is still a largely analog affair done with papers and pens and pencils. However, over a period of two years, as these tablets were first used in the school, newly deployed tablet computers supported the integration of data collection regimes 
with previously established modes of pursuing teacher and student accountability. So I'm talking here about surveillance achieved primarily through looking at data generated by tablets. So as tablets achieved ubiquity, students, teachers, and administrators got wrapped up in many kinds of conflicts about surveillance accomplished via data collection. So as an important bridge to later parts of this project, administrators at the end of my field work, administrators at the school argued that what they really needed to transform education, what they really needed to accomplish these various social justice aims for which they had instituted this tablet computer program was more data data that could stand in for the activity of teachers, students, and parents. So in the next section, I turn to questions of data, uh, and I'm looking at the same schools, but I looked in a different place. So in the previous kind of field work, I spent a long time looking at one individual school. For this next data collection, I went and looked at um, what is called the CMO, or a charter management organization. And so a charter management organization operates several schools, and again, we're looking at the same community. So the same working class Latinx and black community, mostly in South and then in East Los Angeles. Uh, this organization runs charter schools uh, in that community, 15 schools, roughly 10,000 students, grade K through eight. So the one, one thing that I flagged for you before in urban schools was this idea of school reform. So here in Los Angeles, there are more charter schools than in any other city or any other school district. And so a charter school is a public school, but here schools can, charter schools form largely to compete with uh, other kinds of public schools. And so these kind of charter school networks have to have something to distinguish them from their neighboring schools or from competing schools that also are trying to serve students in these same communities. And so this particular charter management organization distinguishes itself by being data-driven. In fact, one of their corporate values is corporate one of their organizational values is promoting a data-driven culture. And so at this charter management organization, they're saying they're gonna be able to address the problems of urban education through the use of data. And my work here really focused on a date, the data team, which was nine people at the charter management organization who were responsible for um, looking at and uh, manipulating data that related to student activities, teaching, uh, test scores, but also demographic attributes of students and their families. And if you look here, this is just one kind of uh, uh, snapshot from the field work that I did there. You can see they're really promoting this kind of startup aesthetic that they are conscientiously um, distinguishing themselves from other organizations, both by their technical capacities and their, the, the work of this data team, but also that they're a startup y that they're a sort of, they're going to adopt these techniques of the tech sector in order to make improvements in urban education. Most of my work here involved interviewing members of the data team, going to their meetings. I also went to conferences with them, and I found important differences in how different parts of the team understood data and understood what data could stand in for. However, all of the work produced by the data team ended up in the same mode, and that is it all ended up as a dashboard produced by Tableau, federated onto a platform a bespoke platform of 125 different dashboards. So wherever the data came from and however experts thought about it, they expressed their findings in all the same way through these dashboards, which I argue in another publication really compressed a lot of the heterogene heterogeneity of the data and also the kind of qualities and differences in conclusions that people were making into a kind of compressed visual space, which implied a kind of actuarial certainty and objectivity, even when the underlying analysis or the underlying data did not support it. So what do we end up with? Well, we end up with the messy world of school. We produce via all these devices and platforms a bunch of data, and then we compress the data out into a dashboard. So kind of in response to this feeling that the dashboard was inadequate to the purposes that it was being put, uh, the data team had some interesting things to say. Um, one, the, the, the chief of analytics kind of explained this by saying, well, every data set tells a story. That in fact, what you need in order to make sense of life uh, among students and teachers is this narrative quality, which is a thread we'll pick up later. But one thing that everyone agreed on was again, a demand for more data. So here's a, a quote, uh, expressing that sentiment by a senior student information manager, Haley. She says, there's a lot of holes in the data and so it's hard to find the most important information. So a lot of times we're kind of guessing how to best serve our students because we're not finding as much data as we'd like. So again, expressing this idea that, well, we might not have achieved the kind of insight that we want, but if we get more data, 
it will, again, justify our approaches to data because we'll finally be able to accomplish these things we want to accomplish. It's kind of voraciousness of organizations for data. So this is the section where I'm going to spend um, the rest of my time. And I'm going to talk here about some new work that I'm doing in this area. But again, I got here via being interested in educational technology and this kind of voracious demand for data. And as we said at the beginning of the talk, I wanted to kind of look the other way and think, well, this is what organizations that are coming into the community, these are the kinds of technological transformations they're trying to make. How are these being met by people in the community? And so uh, in this section I call access as surveillance. Uh, I'm, work, I'm thinking about community organizations and community organizers who are already in the community and how they are responding to these kind of new demands uh, for data, both from organizations, but also in a kind of larger cultural sense, this kind of idea that we can mediate any kind of sociality with data. So the first thing I did in this area, this uh, to kind of start this work is first I just asked people what they were doing. And so um, when I started here at UC Irvine in 2019, um, I held a workshop, which I called Datafication and Community Activism. So I invited community organizations and community organizers to come to campus and talk about what they thought was happening in this space and what kind of collaborations we could have between community organizations and uh, academics. So groups that came included Data for Black Lives, the Bronx Defenders, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, Measure Austin, Our Data Bodies, the Urban Institute, IRISE, a few different organizations, also graduate students um, and fellow faculty members from UC Irvine Informatics and also other places, librarians and archivists as well. Um, so in this work, this kind of two days that we spent talking, the first day we just asked community groups to kind of present their work and explain what they thought this space was about. And which is kind of unusual, none of the scholars present talked the first day. And then the second day we kind of broke into smaller groups. And instead of saying, what work can we do? It kind of became more a question of like, well, what do we think uh, research in this space can look like? And how could it benefit the communities that we care about? So we drew out a lot of incommensurability and also um, some agreement on a few questions. And there was a real divide in the group in that some people in the group felt that datafication draws its power from a long history of state violence and that, it, that datafication in itself constituted a form of harm. Other members of the group, of our, our group that was talking, took a different position and they were saying, well, community knowledge and digital data together can mobilize resources to address concerns within our community. So there's a real disagreement there. Um, but despite the fact that we were not unanimous in our approach, uh, we did come together in thinking about a few themes that would be useful for everybody to pursue. And those are harm, self-defense versus empowerment and abolition. So those are kind of ongoing things that we're still thinking about. I have written elsewhere about the difficulty of working with community organizers, but um, in the next slide, I'm just gonna flag away that this is a very contentious ongoing area and there are many community organizers who do not want to work with academics and consider any form of collaboration with academics a, a form of harm. I always cite the work of community organizers the same way I would cite the rest of the scholarly articles that I'm uh, reading from out of respect and also out of deference to the knowledge that is produced by community organizers, but that in itself produces problems. And that was kind of what I was writing about in this other piece. Um, but again, I just want to say community organizers with respect to the work that I'm doing, a lot of responses. So responses include um, suspicion, anger, recalcitrance, but they also include support, generosity, camaraderie. So a great variety of responses there. In terms of incommensurabilities, I do want to point to the work of um, some of our comrades at the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. They produced this document in cooperation with another group of community organizers who are themselves scientists and scholars called the Free Radicals. And this, in this image, what they're talking about is they're interested in surveillance and they're interested in the kind of operations of algorithms in minoritized communities. And they point here to this tier in the middle, this institutional tier. And what they're arguing in this document is that there is a whole infrastructure of government agencies, academia, and private interests that converge to produce surveillance and harm in minoritized communities. And of course, this is, these are their words now. 
These institutions uphold harmful ideologies and fund, create, or otherwise influence the development and implementation of technology. So we should be careful to just indicate that we cannot sort of grab up the work of community organizers and take it as our own. We have to be careful to uh, point to the ways that there are deep incommensurabilities here that we don't want to paper over. Uh, so what I've done in this space then, starting in 2019, is with the help of some graduate students and undergraduate students, I've been reviewing public records and websites to construct a database of community-based organizations. And then based on some kind of preliminary findings there, we have developed a sort of uh, interview protocol that we use to interview community organizations workers, specifically focusing on community organizers. So far, we've interviewed 10 people. We're hoping to interview 100. But here's some shots of this kind of database that we're constructing, asking what sorts of data people work with, what they do with it, what their goals in working with data are. On the right are some members of my team. And then in the lower right, that's a kind of meeting that we're having with our community organizer colleagues to talk through some of these questions. So preliminary findings from this work is so far we've identified four overlapping domains. And so these are what these community, organiza community organizations, again, we've we found them primarily locally. So we just said, what are organizations that are working in minoritized communities in South LA? What are they, what kind of work are they doing? And so based on their own descriptions of their work, they're working in these domains, education, environment, criminal justice, and immigration, not always just in one. And so it's not the case that there are clear divisions. There are some organizations that just do criminal justice, but many organizations work on a few different things. So another preliminary finding is that there's a real difference in what constitutes a community organization one in terms of its relationship to the community that it serves, how it is thinking of bounding that community, if they work all over California, if they work in South, Southern California, if they work in LA County, if they work in Orange County, or if they serve the Black community, or if they serve the Latinx community. This is an important difference. But there's also a kind of organizational difference in that some of the organizations are just a person with a shingle. They've set up a shop, they put out a website. Some of them are kind of funded offshoots of national advocacy organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union. But we got really interested in the work of community organizers. And so community organizing is slightly different than a community organization. Community organizers are people involved in grassroots efforts defined and guided by the constituency living with the problem. So the, the, the grassroots, I think, is the real emphasis that we put here on community organizing. Community organizing is a general technique of social change and political action, not a political orientation. So there are community organizers working in all parts of the American political spectrum. So it's impossible to say categorically who speaks for a community or what the community's interests are. The thing that interests us is that community organizers themselves have many tools and concepts that name and describe the capacities of collective action, voice, democratic action, accountability, diversity. So here's what some of the community organizers we've been talking to are saying. Um, here's Shauna, who works in environmental, as an environmental justice advocate. She manages a database and she says, I'm not a data scientist. I don't collect data personally. I bumble around in Excel. For me, it's more so about what does the data mean for people, for emission commitments, and what's the best way to get there. This is a sentiment that um, I've heard often from many kinds of data professionals who say, well, I'm not a real data professional. Then you get a job in an organization working with data. You say, well, I'm not a real data scientist. You know, then you get a master's degree and you say, well, I don't have a PhD, I'm not a real data scientist. So I found this kind of professional humility in many different kinds of data workers. Stacy, who's a community educator working on immigration, immigration issues, says there's a lot of data out there. My job is translating it so that it's understandable or even knowing that it exists. Michaela, who's a youth justice organizer in criminal justice reform, she works partly in managing a database of officer-involved homicides, cases where police officers have killed civilians. And part of her work there is making requests, freedom of information requests, to get official documents and then supplementing those documents with community descriptions of incidents. And she says, reading all of that is so tolling on you because you get to read about the last few minutes of a person's life and how their life was taken away by law enforcement, especially because it's opened by a family member. It's always reopening trauma, reopening a wound. So these are some of the, just some of what's coming out of our interviews. So to kind of think some more about uh, what data means in this context, we're abstracting a little bit and getting, kind of taking what community organizers are telling us and trying to fit it into some theoretical frame. So this is some work that um, I have just published 
uh, with my colleague Morgan Curry on this very question. And so we're looking at this phenomenon. We're saying, okay, here are these communities, here are these community organizers trying to work with data for political change, but also disputing these properties of data that in many cases they consider a kind of enclosure of their life. And so first we said, well, data, we looked at two kind of genealogies of data. So one, um, a more familiar idea of data from datafication is that there is some kind of intensification of proliferation of computers and computer-like devices, and that that relates to the, the growing significance of techno-scientific capital in the United States over the past, say, 100 years. So that's the first sort of genealogy and perhaps the better known one. But we also say that data relates to the history of the growth of the state. And so the work of bureaucratic statisticians working in the 19th century uh, so we kind of join these together, these two distinct histories of quantification and more recent work on datafication to argue that numbers and data are inseparable from the political structures that shape relations between communities, individuals, and the state. And so for this reason, um, we argue that community organizers that want to use data for political change in working class communities of color or any, uh, any minoritized or racialized community are in fact in a sort of double bind. And this is because data are themselves theory laden. And in many cases, data reify assumptions of white supremacy by the state. Another way in which we could see this, or maybe to make it more concrete, is we would say, well, data work responsibilizes the very communities who are harmed by policies of the state to produce evidence, evidence that is largely already known by the state. Um, as Muhammad writes, modern understandings of racial difference recapitulate the concepts of blood and heredity via statistical reasoning. That uh, in the last century, uh, the state formed primarily by measuring black lives and their worthiness as citizens and humans via crime st statistics. So via measurement of criminality, disease, and intelligence, metrological articulations of racial inferiority, in fact, undergird American life and have shaped it since the 19th century. From this perspective, uh, data themselves are artifacts of traces of intense social conflict. And again, working with data demands resources, including in many cases, the labor of community members themselves. So such a demand to produce data uh, directs community resources towards clerical work, towards public relations, towards scientific communication, rather than the redress of structural inequality. So just a simple illustration of what we're talking about here. This is an article from the news from Wired Magazine. It says, body cameras haven't stopped police brutality. So my, my position here, or relative to the theories I'm talking about today, the reason this hasn't worked is that this, the, the use of police body cameras as a response to uh, the distribution of violence via the state in the form of policing is not a problem that, that is created by a lack of evidence. And in fact, there is no evidence that can be produced that would address that distribution of violence because it assumes that uh, the state makes decisions based on evidence and based on rational deliberations and consensus. But this ignores the way that social divisions are based on unequal political and economic power and that it is this political and economic power that determines uh, which voices will be brought up in order to contribute to a consensus. Uh, so the idea that we can find politically neutral premises via data or whatever, whatever kind to facilitate democratic decision-making will be blind to the role of power relations that determine which meanings and arguments are considered the most legitimate in the first place. So to get out of this double bind, the community organizers and other kinds of activists that we're looking at, but primarily community organizers, we could appeal to this idea of political agonism. Agonism is a political philosophy articulated by Chantal Mouffe. And her, her theory of agonistic pluralism proposes that meaningful democratic action thrives through ongoing clashes of power. She says that political identities are built on exclusions, on an us that has meaning only in relation to a them, typically an elite, against say the liberal media, the deep state, the deep state or, or illegal immigrants or else to the 1% or to neoliberalism or to corporate capitalism. So these differences result in antagonisms uh, that Mouf says are generative and productive, that they motivate people to get politically involved and imagine alternative futures that can reshape political life. So the agonistic perspective really disputes this consensus view of democratic action, claims that purport to be universal, rational, and politically neutral, such as data, are constructed through inclusions and exclusions about what can be said and how. 
So building on theories of agonism, then we start to notice that some, some of the ways that organizers are using data, which I'm just gonna shorthand as data practices, uh, do not function as a step towards building consensus through evidence, but instead are concentrated on contestation and coercion uh, on affect and rhetoric. So putting that all together, we're talking about community organizers engaging in agonistic data practices. And we've defined this as the use of data for contestation, not resolution, and efforts to motivate political action through affect and narrative building. So two parts to that. So one, the goal of such action, which is for contestation. And then we're starting to notice also something about the mode of these data practices, which has to do with affect and narrative building. Again, we think that what we're seeing is that um, a lot of the data, the data that is used in this kind of commu this community responses to data and data intensive technologies tend towards the aesthetic and affective capacities of data. We're suggesting that agonistic data practices differ from more conventional approaches to statistical reasoning and that they use contention. They're focused on that contention and conflict and that they're trying to mobilize communities together uh, in response to perceived threats. And again, I'm arguing, we're arguing here that part of what the way that this functions is through what we call super representational qualities of data. So not just a kind of uh, brute quantification, but in this affective dimension of data that engenders emotional responses towards political action and also towards a narrative capacity that could amplify and sharpen community voice. So I'll give you just a couple examples here. So this on one end, we could think of as a sort of enclosure of life and minoritized communities, one uh, affected by the state. So on the top, we have a newspaper article that says the LA police reform advocates, some of which are included in this kind of this uh, snowball sampling we've done of community organizers demand that stop LA, demand that LAPD stop using the Cal Gang database. The Cal Gang database is a very large database that contains the names, addresses, and personal information of uh, known gang members and also presumed gang members, which would be can be functionally anyone. So the, it's been shown through freedom of information requests, for example, that the Cal Gang database contains infants, contains many people who have never been convicted of a crime. And in some cases, people are added to the database after they are convicted of a crime. So the, the, the problems of this database have been well documented by journalists. But what, what I'm suggesting is that uh, this constitutes itself a kind of data enclosure against which advocates are arguing, sometimes by using data. So people who want to use data for political ends must necessarily contend with the politics of data and data intensive technologies, the infrastructural and artifactual arrangements that consolidate powers in corporate owned databases used by the state. Digital data has its own political economy, one marked again by the extractive nature of the global tech sector. Data intensive technologies depend on uh, many forms of opacity in their activities. So contrast this kind of organizing against uh, these forms of enclosure via these kinds of arguments, again, made through statistical arguments. So what you're looking at here are examples of kind of data-informed arguments. Data, the data that underlies these rhetorical arguments are collected primarily from city, state, and local agencies. They are collected from public records uh, and used to formulate arguments for social justice in this agonistic mode. So not by arguing for facts and fact a consensus-based approach, excuse me, based on a neutral set of facts, but instead by mobilizing the community itself. And so while agonistic data practices are not unique to minoritized communities, nor do all agonistic politics uh, use data in this kind of super representational mode, they do offer a way out of this double bind of consensus-based approaches. And because data are statistical, but frequently encountered in visual form, uh, in graphical forms, uh, their increasing prominence in everyday life requires many kinds of competencies and literacies, as well as the capacity for certain kinds of feeling. So just as the affective dimensions of data are frequently invoked by political actors, so too are their narrative qualities. They're frequently wrapped up in storytelling. And again, as I pointed to that data scientist working in urban education earlier reminded us, every data set tells a story. And so here we have that emphasis on story. So that was a long trip through various kinds of community responses to data intensive technologies. 
responses frequently enacted via data or arguments performed in the agonistic mode of data practices. So in the end, to get back to my larger project here, what I'm saying is that we wanna decouple the civic goals of public education from ideas about technological progress. So like previous forms of computing applied to schooling, contemporary data intensive ed tech can never accomplish its decades long project of making public education computable and has needlessly sacrificed many other virtues in pursuit of this goal, especially civic virtues. So I call for a broad reevaluation of the purposes of public education in working class communities of color, one that would begin with the American state's abdication of its duty to address systemic racism. Because of a refusal to recognize this duty, the push to insert computers and data intensive technologies into urban school and into other sites of the of provision of state service uh, can never contribute to racial justice or the growth of a more just polity. Instead, I argue that people's community of control articulated here as point 10 of the Black Panther's 10 point program provides a conceptual framework that we could think of as, a, as an alternative arrangement. As the community organizers with whom I've been speaking insist, such a regime would have to capture the value of the work that goes into creating, processing, and circulating educational data, including the labor of teachers, students, and data professionals for the benefits of the communities that they serve. Uh, thank you, that's it. Wow, thanks, uh, Roderick. That was, that was that was great. Really, uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, and you know, smart as ever, always. You know, it's really really great. Um, so, so yeah. Now I think we'll just open up uh, for a sort of general discussion. There's uh, questions, comments. You know, uh, I I can start off by you know I have a couple questions and comments, I guess. Um, you know, so I, I guess, I mean, I I, th I think the, um, the the general structure of your argument, the kind of relationship access as virtue, access as surveillance, all that is, is very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious how like the idea of agonism relates to that contrast or like, and, um, and then I guess, so that's just a kind of open-ended question. Um, and then I get my, my one kind of pushback, like is the way you talk about data, it, it's, I mean, you know, you're, you're focusing, you know, this is obviously a sort of, it's, it started as an ethnographic project. So um, you're looking at the context and the sort of how people are, you know, what they're saying and what they're doing. But I, I think there's a kind of, uh, of, a slightly vague quality to data and you know that kind of over that uh, it, it feels like it's uh, um, kind of overlooking maybe some differences you know between w w how data is produced whether it's like the technical details of specifications of how things are made or maybe more importantly in, in the context of your project is like the relationships that constitute data, right? Like how is it produced, who's using it, and trying to sort of uh, create a sort of description and way of kind of descri describing differences, you know? Um, so it's not just all the same, right? I mean, I, I'm also interested in how this kind of idea of extraction, access of extraction, in your project sort of contrast to this idea of surveillance capitalism and all that, you know, as well. I don't know, these are just like my brain dump, you know, from like the kind of notes I've been taking, but uh, yeah, so. Yeah, well, so thanks for that and thanks everybody for coming and thanks for your questions. Um, so I guess one thing you could do is you could say, I guess to this question of like, isn't data vague in this project? And I would say yes, and I would say um, data, I guess that's why I'm more interested in the concept of datafication. And so what I'm saying is that the, the, there are infrastructural changes. And so you could say, well, what kind of data, what tools are you using? And that's certainly how I began the project, like a very kind of intense engagement with particular devices, particular platforms, with data professionals themselves. What tools do you use? What software do you use? And another project to actually review the code that is produced by a data scientist to make a particular uh, kind of you know, guess or, or a, it's actually a model, but whatever. 
So, you know, it, that, that's staying kind of very close to it. But I guess the, the, the reason that I, I guess my warrant for coming out of it though, is one, what is the experience of working class communities of color themselves? And so from the perspective of communities themselves, is it that important what data is? The, the power of data is not really attenuated by any particular instantiation. The power of data is cultural and ideological, also economic, and I guess in this case, political. And so uh, I guess, sadly, we would hope, sure, we wanna know, we wanna forensically know what kind of data, what kind of platform, what kind of tool. But I guess increasingly, I don't think that's how it works. I think actually the opposite, that sort of, anything that is called data or anything that circulates as data takes on the power of datafication or derives its power from datafication. And so that's really what, that was kind of that middle section which I'm glossing over, which is how this one particular school organization gets a lot of kind of power and authority by saying, well, wait, we're data driven. And so I'm saying, well, where, where, where is the imperative that an organization or institution should be data driven in the first place? Where does that come from? And I think it comes from this kind of cultural and ideological power of data. So I guess you're right, we could make different, I think all of us would want to see the data and would want to be able to ask questions about it. And we would all want to be able to sort of tinker with it, but its power doesn't really rest on that. I don't even think its power really rests very much on, on the ability to conclude anything from it, right? And there's a really um, counterintuitive finding in that middle section, when you look at organizations that work with data, the people who work the most closely with data are the most skeptical about the claims that you can make with data. And so that really surprised me. But the data scientists are like, data's a mess. Like I, I they're like, I can, I can guess, I can make a, I, you know, I can try, I can get close, I'll, I'll make a hypothesis. But the people who are really certain are the, the sort of people who are looking at that dashboard who are like, well, it says right here, you know, minus 10. So I think people who work very closely with data realize that its power is tentative, it's propositional, um, that it is not any kind of absolute, but that's not what we're seeing, right? We're seeing any kind of association with data. Uh, your dating app is scientific now, right? It uses data to find you an ideal match or the, the wine company, they're data driven now and data allows them to pair you perfectly with the wine. And so what I'm looking at is when you apply that, that logic, to, this, to the organs of the state, to the provision of state service. And that's also what the community organizers are worried about. There were other good questions in there, but that was the only one I could remember. Yeah, fascinating, super, super interesting. Um, so I, I think this is, if anybody else has any com have comments or questions, please jump in. Um, I have one more sort of comment, which is, I mean, so you're taking a, a pretty, you're clearly, you know, articulating a critical perspective around all of this. Um, I, I'm just wondering, you know, you talked about that contrast between the, the, the group of folks that you convened and how some thought there was the possibility for using this data in, in sort of uh, empowering ways, right? Um, and others, just saw it as, as an, you know, an instrument of, of power, you know, of oppression. What, what, where do you fall, it seems like, within that? Um, my own interest, I feel conflicted, right? And so I think some community organizers do not want you to engage with their work in an academic way because community organizing is really all about grassroots organizing. And it's about like, we are gonna build power in our community to deal with the problems that we have. And so a lot of them, um, are hostile to the university. One, because the university itself is hostile to them. Many of these are, for example, black women or women of color. You know, they could easily point to the way that they are excluded from academic spaces or you know, made to feel under threat or uncomfortable in academic spaces. That's a very hard, uh, I can't solve that problem for anybody, right? So when I say, oh yeah, come into this academic space that has been hostile to you and everyone like you, you know, I can't, I can't really solve that problem. And so that was very shocking and troubling to me. Um, not shocking, but just that was like a hard thing to, to right. sort of deal with. I had to be like, okay, that's fair. You know, I understand why you might not want to come here. It doesn't yeah. have anything to do with me personally. I, I, when, when I was doing some research in Detroit, I got pushback from folks there a very similar way, you know. Well, where, where, where they, is the lie? Where is the lie? 
you know, where they, they, they perceived academics as appropriating their work, as somehow extracting value, you know. Again, where, where, if you, where is the lie? So I, I think that's something that I'm still working to overcome. And so I think that's why I was point to moments where people are saying, actually, this is not how we want to do it. But the point where I agree with community organizers and where I feel like I have been able to get somewhere is that both community organizers and me myself and my own research are interested in the experiential knowledge of working class communities of color. And so um, the reason that many community organizers are hostile to academic researchers is they do not think academics respect uh, the experiential knowledge of, of people of color, especially working class people, working class people of color, people of color in general. And so that makes a problem for me because I wanna be critical and I wanna say, well, you're trying to use data for good, but data has its own political economy. You know, if you, you we, a lot of these kind of uh, documents that are produced by the organizers, they're, they're shared via commercial platforms. They're, you know, they, they're contributing to that economy, whether or not they, they, whether or not that's something that is a part of their own political project. But part of respecting the experiential knowledge of working class communities of color for me is to say, well, that's how you've chosen to do your activism. It's not up to me to come in and say, that's not the way you should do your, your activism. That's not the way you should do your community organizing. So that's how I got interested in the way that they, I should not assume that they themselves are unaware of these politics. I should have said, attend to the way that they acknowledge and deal with them. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. And that's what I think is actually the most interesting part. And so critical research that says you're doing it right, you're not doing it right. Nobody wants to read that. Nobody, I don't, yeah. nobody is interested in, in reading. Yeah, you're, you're just sort of teasing out these, you know, tensions, which is, it's, it's really, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'll take a question, Dustin. Yeah, jump in. Uh, great talk, Roderick. Thank you for, for coming and doing, I guess, coming and doing the talk. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, we use a lot of data in the department. I'm a professor in the CS department with Dustin. And, you know, we use data in the department for all kinds of things, right? And one of the things is always around, uh, you know, minoritized populations, retention, uh, recruitment, graduation rates, and just making sure that we're not, uh, uh, hurting one group or advantaging one group uh, in our in our approach um, and trying to help you know hopefully the retention of everyone's equal whether you're white or black or male or female or uh, anything else right and uh, but I always find this thing that you know one of the organizations we work with all the time is NC WIT which is the National Center for Women in IT um, they always very much talk about how they're data-driven, research-driven organization. And I, I understand that we can say, hey, here's a tactic that has worked at several schools to help with the retention of minorities or, or female students. Um, but yeah, I always find this, I always find this, uh, like you're pointing out, this conundrum between this is such a human problem. Um, and, and if somebody out there has a story, I feel like what we should be doing is gathering the data to help support that story because they're so experienced and they're so in touch with the problem. Uh, and then other times it's like we almost ignore the story and, and, and just focus on the data. Like clearly this is working and I don't, um, yeah, it's just a comment I wanted to make that you were saying that there's this connection between the story and the data and what drives me in a lot of these very human problems is, is the story. That's what gets me to work hard at it and, and invest my time and energy. Um, you know, if we're studying like traffic, it's just like, oh, there's just data about traffic and I'm happy to rearrange the traffic lights to move traffic through and that's just a data problem to me. But when you're talking about retention and minoritized students, that, that feels to me like in my soul, it's always felt like the data is uh, robbing me of the experience or I'm not connecting with it as much. Mm. Um, so I just kind of wanted to comment on that, but I'm sure. You yeah, thank you so much. And also, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah. So the first thing I wanted to say was when you were talking about the work that you're doing with data to try to retain students from minoritized communities, I thought, well, that's a laudable goal. So we should just start there. So how best to do that? What works? I don't know. Well, that's a that's a separate conversation. Or I guess it's not one that we can have in this particular exchange, but I would be happy to have it. The sure. second thing I wanted to say is, I think you're maybe in the same zone I'm in when you say you're looking at the National Center of Women in IT, right? Yeah. So the first thing we have to do is we have to respect the autonomy of that organization to use tools that suit its purposes. Absolutely. So rather than call sort of balls and strikes on how well that's working, 
for, for all kinds of reasons, we want to say, well, if you within your own community, I'm not a woman in IT. So if like a, a woman in IT or women in IT have decided that this is how they want to organize and this is what we want to do, we have to find ways to support that work. So that would be the, the next thing to do. And then I love this thing about narrative, because to me, this is the weirdest thing. So the appeal of data and its allure rests on its objectivity, right? Um, all data can describe the world. We'll get systems of computers that can process the data. Um, data will we'll have a domain, maybe we'll have a domain expertise who will be responsible for mapping an unruly and cooperative reality into some kind of data structure. And then we'll just compute on it and we'll have access to the entire world in miniature inside this world of data. So as absurd as that sounds, that is actually the logical kind of operation of being data driven, right? That's what being data driven means. So the other thing that's happening is data are so ubiquitous, they're all over the place. People can use data now as a general resource in story the same way you can use any other culturally available resource. So now you can incorporate data as a prop in a story you want to tell about good versus evil or whatever else. There's just real narrativity in data. And I just think that's the weirdest thing because it's like, well, if the narrative is important, what do you need the data for? If you have a great story, you don't really need data for that. But that's actually not how it works. It's like, it's like a, uh, it's like the kind of narrative turn in data. I, I think it just has to do with the total ubiquity of data and its kind of ideological and cultural power. And um, Paul Durish, who's here at the University of Irvine, has written about this, about narrativity and data. He has a great article where he just kind of lays it out. Um, it's, it's Durish and Gomez is the, the authors of this article. But I love this article because when I read it, I just thought, it felt, I was like, that's the weirdest thing. But I was like, yes, that's exactly what it is. That's why this, this data scientist is saying every data set tells a story. It's like, what, what do we need to mediate the story with data for? Well, a story told via data is tremendously more compelling and powerful than just a regular old story. So as weird as that is, and as, as little sense as that makes, I feel like that's the moment that we're in. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. And I, that's why I was saying that when somebody has a powerful story, with great experiences or personal experiences about being minoritized in a CS domain or a tech world. Um, I wanna listen to that story and then figure out what's the data I can gather to support it, to help support their story, because I believe it, um, even if I didn't experience it, I'm trying to like, you know, wrap it all up. Um, so it's just this kind of chicken and egg problem, you know, um, sometimes just focusing on the data first, I feel, I feel is kind of soulless way to look at it, then all these students are just numbers that we're trying to push through and and that's not it at all like we're which then to, puts you in the in the zone where now you need to tell a convincing story to get out of that zone where everybody's yeah, right. we're just gonna you know we're gonna hover back and forth between this all the time yeah that's the, that's the catch 22 right 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 so looks like noah has a question um if you don't mind i would uh, i would love to ask a question actually um with uh or sorry i am an uh, undergraduate student um, at Western, uh, pre-major uh, CS, um, but this lecture series just seemed really interesting, so I'm trying to hop on and watch as many as I can. But um, as far as where we go from here, I know you talked a little bit about um, the restructuring of just how we view data, um, but as far as the practice of using data seems a little bit um, kind of so entwined in kind of everything that we do, like in the current day and age. So how how do we like be aware and be cognizant of the power that data has and that datafication has while not necessarily quitting the use of it entirely? Um, well, thanks for the question and thanks for coming. Um, I don't know. I think one thing, one frustration I share is that I think like a lot of people who came from technical fields and sort of ended up in, in informatics, which is a sort of hybrid technical social scientific field. We want the we want to build things, we want to kind of apply solutions, we want to have best practices. And I think actually that's part of the problem here. So it's not the case that we should have a single takeaway and we should have a single kind of set of operations that we can infinitely scale that will always work. That's part of the problem. So one problem is to think of the world as kind of a series of domains that are going to all be computable. So I would say the, the general approach, or I guess one I use in research that I, I don't know if this is going to solve your problem, but maybe a place to start. One would be to approach um, 
epistemological questions or questions of knowing from a position of humility. And so instead of saying, how do I get the right answer to just say, well, what is it in this space? How does my participation in this space change the outcome? And more importantly, what was happening there before I got there? And so in all these places, there are people who have been working, many people who have made it their life's work to um, work on things they care about. So to work on cleaning up the ocean or to work on uh, reducing violence in communities or all kinds of things. And so I think as technical people, we almost always make the mistake of coming in with a solution rather than coming in to kind of see what people are already doing. So that's really where I'm coming from in my work with community organizers. And again, it's not uh, easy work. And in many cases, you know, you will be, you will not be welcomed with open arms, you know, just because you showed up with a computer. In, in many cases, people will not want you there, <laughs> you know, not want your computer there. But I think I would say begin from a position of humility and also always recognize that there are other people there who have already been working. And then secondly, uh, you have to be mindful of your own positionality. And so one, if you come in as a technical person, you are bringing that authority, but also that baggage with you. And so you have to, among the many other sort of positions that you have to acknowledge when you're working on a difficult problem that involves people, your own position as a technical expert is uh, authoritative. Um, it makes, it, it wraps you up in a whole bunch of problems about whose knowledge counts. It wraps you up in who is allowed to be an expert of that kind and who is not, but we're not gonna avoid these problems. We're already in them. But that's not an easy answer I, re I recognize. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Uh, so any other questions? Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll probably wrap up in the next few minutes here. Yeah, I appreciate people coming. Like the whole last half of that talk is just sort of new stuff. So I appreciate being able to try out new material on the road. Thank you. Oh. Well, um, really wonderful. Great job. Thank you so much, Perry. I appreciate you coming. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah. Toodaloo. Bye bye. Uh, all right, uh, Roderick. Thanks. Thanks again. We'll, we'll uh, talk soon. Okay. Thanks again for having me. Thanks again for coming, everyone. All right. Bye bye.